plants in the world. <laughs> Man, everything just wants to glitch at the beginning of my stream today. Well, anyways, welcome to the Michael Cisco show. A very special guest today who is deprived of my intro music working properly. Um, but welcome to the show, Roosh V. For anyone who lives under a rock, could you just go ahead and introduce yourself? Thank you, Michael. It's good to be on. I think the demons were trying to stop the stream because of the orthodox power here. <laughs> um, just uh, for people who don't know, I uh, built up my name in... Uh, being a pickup artist for many years, I would teach men how to pick up girls. I wrote a lot of books on it, uh, not only in the, in the United States, but abroad as well in South America and Europe. And I did that for a very long, long time. And then I started to hit a dead end um, and I suffered a loss in my family, which kind of woke me up and revealed to me what uh, wrong path I was on. And then I came back to God in 2019 and trying to grapple with the grace that God gave me a new life, so to speak. And I was just received in the Russian Orthodox Church abroad in on Pascha this May. So I have been in the in the Orthodox Church for a couple of months now and continue my walk with Christ. Glory to God. I know uh you went to a great place to do it too. Um, I don't know if that's public, uh, Holy Holy Trinity Monastery, right? It was baptized there, okay. and I I consider Holy Trinity to be my spiritual home. Um, um, it's just uh, I have some kind of connection to it. So, yeah, yeah, I, I was there a couple years ago. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to go down in the crypt, but. That 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 place just brought me to tears. Just with the uh, like, you can just feel the sanctity in the air. I don't know how to really describe it, but I'm sure you experienced it. Yeah, and the longer you're able to stay there, the more of the grace you're able to feel. Not only during the services, but outside of the services too. There, one thing I noticed is that there's a lot of quote coincidences, a lot of pleasant coincidences that uh, happen there, and. I think it's uh, God allows the providence to occur because uh, there's so many holy people or so many people there who are striving to reach God. Yeah, yeah. I hope hope to go back soon. But um, so you you got involved in the I guess the pickup community, and you eventually left. How did you come to? to get involved in that to begin with? So when I was in college, I was consumed with lust. I wanted to, I mean, there was um, half naked college girls all around me, especially during the summer, but I didn't have the confidence or the know-how to fornicate with them. And that was starting to bother me. It was starting to, it was kind of the seed of this weird anger that was brewing like why couldn't i achieve what all the other secular men were seemed to be achieving and then uh in a random way i stumbled across a pickup artist uh booklet online i, I remember the name was tony's lay guide and this guide and I, I actually many years later was able to meet tony and he was just like a normal guy but this guide was like the bible that i had been searching for uh, it was like the anti-bible how to sin and i started and i have something of a scientific analytical mind and i really soaked up what it taught me and once i was able to graduate from college i basically um use this book as a guide to how to live. And I used it to start to meet women, uh, go out, uh, mostly in bars and clubs, but later during the daytime too. And I just, uh, it allowed me to fulfill the lustful desires that I did have. But like with any addiction, any type of sin, you need to up the dose. It's just not enough that, okay, I slept with a girl and now I'm done. No, you keep going and keep doing it in different situations to keep the novelty going, to get your dopamine spike, to increase the 
pleasure. So um, once I got tired of doing it in the United States, that's when I started to hit the road. And I started to, I guess, add to the pickup artist canon uh, of Rouge to it, I guess you can say, and uh, traveling abroad and how to perform that type of sin, um, not only in the United States, but around the entire world. Wow. And and so I know you already kind of hit on it with you eventually you, you had a loss in your family and that kind of woke you up a little bit. Was there was there anything in your worldview that I guess that changed from when you began to I guess in a, in a kind of metaphysical sense that kind of developed over time or was it just that one event? that just kind of hit you one thing that did develop in time is that i logically could deduce that i can't top the pleasures that i was getting so for every new way of sleeping with a woman would give me an increased dopamine but if i did it the same way i noticed that the pleasure was lower so i i was chasing this kind of this this high until i i realized um, in a secular way that I can't top this anymore. I, I could dedicate my life to women, which I was, but I could dedicate even more time to it, but I'm simply not going to top the rush of when I first started using it, the rush of my first um, intimate encounters abroad in this country, in this language. So once I realized that, that there was this point of diminishing return to pleasurable pursuits, I thought to myself, well, I'll just go ahead and transition from trying to sleep with a lot of girls and making it this kind of nonstop fun party time into just finding one really amazing girl and settling down with her and kind of constraining my lust and I guess my unreasonable expectations of what a relationship is just to her alone. But I would still try to find her in the secular way i would still use the same tactics um to sleep with the girl the same night as i would to find a girlfriend who i thought maybe could turn into my wife yeah that's uh that's actually the, the kind of good segue into <laughs> my next qu well another question later but um how difficult was it for you to to kind of make that change once you um, came back to Christ. I know it's a, a particularly difficult addiction to overcome for, I think, most men uh, with, in some regard, especially with like pornography and, and whatnot. How was that? Did you just kind of quit cold turkey or what was that process like for you? So before this and the way that the grace came upon me in 2019 is when I just started to pray. I prayed for the first time and I felt uh, almost immediate change. A burden was lifted. Um, I remember I shed many tears, even though I didn't understand why. Before that, I did try to moderate some of the addictions that I had. And the biggest example was caffeine. So I was a daily coffee drinker. If you live in Europe, it's impossible not to drink coffee. Um, you know, all the coffee shops are way better than what we have in the United States. Many, many times I tried to quit. Uh, many times I was able to quit for, but never longer than two months. So for two months, I quit and then I started to ease back into it again. So just to state on my own willpower alone, I could not quit coffee. I just could not do it. It was too hard. I enjoyed it too much. So when this grace came upon me, I was uh, dating a woman and it was a couple days after I started to pray and I said to myself, I don't think I can sleep with her anymore. And I hadn't read the gospel. I didn't know what the rules, the commandments were. I didn't know anything. I didn't know what Christ demanded of me. But suddenly I started to feel this intuition or it's coming from my heart or somewhere that I can't keep doing this. And I stopped completely. I stopped sex completely and masturbation, looking at pornography overnight. Overnight, I stopped. The biggest addiction that I had had, that I had fed for almost 20 years, every day obsessing about it, fantasizing about it, executing it, doing it, teaching it overnight. 
Um, so this I must attribute to God's to God's grace, because like I said, on my own strength, the most I can do uh, was quit coffee for one month. And thank God it's over two years since then. And I've been able with his grace to stay on this right path. And I don't ever want to go back. I don't want to go back. So whatever it takes to keep that grace coming. And I think it's one step at a time getting closer to him. I want to hold on to it. Glory to God. Uh, there's a lot of speculation in the chat that you're lifting again. Is this true? <laughs> so one thing when you're in Europe, um, it's just, um, it's more, more can do more active. And then I moved back in 2019 to the United suburbs, man, the suburbs, you become a blob in a short time. <laughs> and so I was becoming blob like, I don't, I, I never really was a blob, but I have started to walk more often. Um, I don't lift heavy weights, but I do minor calisthenic exercises. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but I'm not getting big, so. Okay. We have Luke Kindrat in the chat. So, you know, we, uh, he puts I will us never all never get as big as <laughs> Luke is. <so. laughs> I'm trying. I try and go pretty consistently, but, you know, this camp, it's, it's pretty rough on the campaign trail. So, um, but what, as a, one thing that I struggle with, because I, I come from, you know, I was, I can't say that it was at, at your level of, uh, I guess, success in sinning. But I, I did have a, before I became Orthodox, a pretty promiscuous background, especially after I, I got divorced and whatnot. And then entering the Orthodox world of trying to uh, find a, you know, like a pious spouse and do it the right way has always been a, a bit of a challenge. Um, and I guess trying to, uh, you know, <laughs> still, you know, get dates and, and do it the right way. But um, what would what would you say is the like kind of the essential difference between the secular manner of pursuing women and how orthodox people should do it? So towards my last days of doing the pickup artist thing, uh, one analogy I kept comparing it to is that when you're attracting women in the secular way, you essentially become a clown. You're a clown who enter who entertains them in some way, and you entertain them enough either by striking upon their emotions, pushing and pulling them, making her laugh, telling her interesting stories, or entertaining her with how you look, your muscles, your beard, it could be. Uh, so you're you're a clown to her to catch her attention. One analogy I used to make then was you you just had to be more entertaining than her smartphone. You had to take peel her away from the smartphone, around this from the shiny object that's in her hand to look at you, look at this cool guy who is worth a night in the sack. And what you had to do basically was uh, wear many hats at the same time. You had to be a bodybuilder to always look good. You had to be a style consultant to just be cool and look cool. You had to be a storyteller. You had to be a psychologist because you had to read her emotions. Um, you had to be something like a travel expert to know which countries had the kind of women. So on and on, you could go on. You had to wear these many hats, be an expert in many fields to attract the woman, to really spike her and then strike while the iron is hot to get her into a bedroom for a meaningless encounter that gives you nothing that in fact takes away. Uh, but that's what you had to do. And if you got into a relationship with a woman, now what you had to do was maintain that attraction for weeks and weeks and months. And a lot of the pickup artists, they started to develop what was called dread game. They found out that the best way to keep a girl on the on the hook was to put her in a state of dread where she was scared of losing you. So you would act really cold at times and other times you would be affectionate and complimentary. It was just a game. You were just, you were just playing a game to keep her emotions in a state where she would remain attached to you. And let me say that the failure rate of playing this game is 100%. 100% because there's always going to be a more entertaining clown. There's always going to be a better looking guy, more exotic guy. He has better stories than you, better jokes than you, a better beard than you. Even for me, you're always, I mean, if you, 
if you're using worldly matters to attract a girl, guess what? There's a lot of men in this world, and it's just a matter of time until she finds someone who piques her interest, who spikes her emotions better than better than you. So really, when these guys were playing dread game, what they were were really dread game on themselves because they were in dread that they were going to lose this girl if they didn't play a really psychoanalytical game. So that's what the secular one man watching want to dive into that because <laughs> that's what you have to do. And I, and you need the books, you need the content, the videos, the blogs of men like me who are producing that content to try to crack the code. But the end result of all that, you could spend hundreds of hours doing that. Once in a while, you would sleep with a six out of a 10 on Tinder or in a bar, and she could be your booty call for a month or two until she gets tired of you. But she's probably sleeping with more more guys than once, more than one guy at the same time. Mm. So the secular world, did I sell it? Did does, does people want to dive in? I'm probably not. And so the Christian world, I'm telling you, is completely different. Now, you don't have to be a clown. It's about your faith. It's about your faith in God. Does she recognize it or not? Does she want to start the little church as St. John Chrysostom faith? Who can protect and provide for her and the children who could lead the church in a way to keep evil away as much as, as possible so that now instead of you putting her in a state of dread, uh, keeping her emotions spiked, you really kind of connect with her in a spiritual way so that she sees you as a man who she can, that you, who can lead her to heaven, can lead her to paradise. I mean, that's what the spiritual bond is. But the problem for a lot of men is that in the game way, in the secular way, there's a lot of things that can keep you busy. You can go to the gym and you can uh, work on your look and you can try all these pickup lines and routines and dating and Tinder hacks and on and on. You think like I'm doing something, I'm getting closer because I'm doing all this work. But in the Christian sense, you don't really have that. I mean, yeah, you can go to the gym, but do you really want to attract a woman based on your look primarily? Uh, do you really want to attract a woman based on your stories that you learn from a book? So really there, what you have to do is work on your faith, which isn't a glamorous thing. And if I pray more today, it doesn't mean that tomorrow I'm going to see more attractive looks from girls that I like. So I think guys get caught up in the fact that there's nothing too concrete outside of the faith, outside of presenting yourself as a mature, responsible man who has a plan to make an income. Outside, there's not a whole lot you can do. I mean, yes, you can give to your community. You can give to your neighbors so they're more likely to introduce you to their daughters, granddaughters, and so on. There's things like that, just being a good person in the Christian sense. But there's not this hundred uh, item check checklist that you had to go through like in with the with the pickup artist thing. So I think this kind of makes guys feel like I'm not moving forward with this. I'm no closer to meeting a woman because um, I haven't, you know, I haven't uh, gone on dates, at least in the pickup artist sense, you have signs that you're moving forward. Oh, I kissed a girl in this bar and then I made out with one. I got one to my front door. She didn't come upstairs. So it feels like a video game in the sense that you're progressing through the levels. But for many of the Christian men I met, it's not like that. It's basically they had nothing, no prospects, no hope for a wife. And then they met one and they got married and now they have four or five kids. So I think don't look for signs that are getting closer. I mean, there isn't going to be a sign until the wife that you're going to marry appears before you and things seem to work. Yeah. I know you mentioned, mentioned St. John Chrysostom. Uh, many of us have read I uh, I'm assuming that you've read on marriage and family. It sounds like you have <laughs> his homilies on marriage and family. Um, what could you tell us about what he has to say on, on what to look for in a spouse and how can we really apply that to a modern context? You know, I can't speak too much of uh, what he taught, but from what I could understand, uh, he said that really the home is just a church away from the 
church. You're basically establishing a temple. Your home is a temple where you are the priest, you lead the parish, you can see your wife as a deacon and your children as the layman. And you lead them all. You lead them all to where they need to be. Not, of course, you have to feed them and clothe them and make sure that there's fire, um, fire and uh, sorry, wood in the fireplace, and they're warm. These material needs, the basics, are needed to worship God on a level that is basic. But really, I mean, what good is if you put your family into a mansion and they have all the comforts in a swimming pool, heated swimming pool, and the most beautiful marble countertops, double double ovens, all the name brand. Uh, what good is that if you're not leading them in a spiritual way that leads to their salvation? I mean, then you kind of didn't do your job and you're going to have to uh, hold uh, yourself accountable to God after you die if you did it in the wrong way. I mean, you have to make the effort to bring them to God. And I tell you, it's a lot easier if you find a girl who's already there who's already in the Orthodox Church, who already has, thank God, a belief in, in God. She prays. Um, I think a lot, the, the big temptation for men, and it's, it's a story I hear again and again, is meeting a woman who's not there and wanting to get her there. Um, but I was warned um, by many holy men, do not make a project out of a woman. And But then you start, but then the temp temptation is, well, it's not really a project to turn an atheist into an orthodox girl, is it? You know, so it's tough. It's tough. And I can't tell. And a lot of guys ask me for advice. I can't help you there. You have to talk to a priest. I don't know what a project is or not. I've kind of taken time away from date, from just even thinking of dating. And, um, uh, but uh, I think some of us have to learn the hard way. And the only advice I can give is don't damage yourself too much. Don't damage yourself too much before or you meet if God wills marriage for you. Because even a courtship can actually hurt you. Even a courtship that doesn't go to where it needs to be. You had a fantasy of where it was going. It seemed so right. And then it fails in the end. That can definitely hurt. You know, and um, it, of course, it's better that in a way that you didn't, you weren't sexually active in a Christian courtship that, that ends, but emotions are still in, involved. And so we have to be careful, dive into some kind of relationship courtship with any girl we th see and meet who we think potential is there for. Yeah. I, one thing you mentioned earlier that I, I think is interesting Um is that 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 constant search for a dopamine rush and i think i think that's the way kind of the basis of a lot of relationships in general um even even some marriages like like people get married in in expectation that this person is going to provide them a feeling um do you kind of do you think that that perhaps that whole that whole mindset is is linked to the current state of marriage and family in the U.S. in that sense? I think the mainstream idea of marriage is based on this is based on this emotional happiness, physical happiness, to covet a sex life. I'm going to have sex with this very attractive person forever. They're never going to get old because they're going to get Botox and on and on. And so they go into a marriage looking at a, this person, this person is going to make me happy. This person is going to make me happy in this life and fulfill me in some way. Cause I don't have God in my life. So I need this person. If this person doesn't pan out, I'm in trouble. And if I'm ever bored or if I as a man ever have eyes for another girl, then that's a sign that this girl isn't it and I'm going to divorce her and go back into the dating market on and on. I think that's the secular idea of it. Um, one thing that one danger that Orthodox Christian men have to understand is that if you maintain a pure state of your body like God commands us to to do. You have to understand that when an attractive girl has affections for you, this can be a rush that is hard to uh, handle. This can be a rush that's hard to deal with in the sense of being liked by an attractive girl is very validating for a man. Even if you don't have sex with her, it could cloud your judgment. 
And um, of course, if you have sex with her, your hope of having good judgment is zero. But even if not, don't think, oh, because I'm not having sex with her. I'm compl I'm being completely logical about this and I'm going to be able to make a good decision. No, because men, especially in this day and age where sex is thrown at us since we were kids, uh, we don't really have any innate defense against a pretty face. We, we, we just don't. If a pretty girl likes us, we're in trouble in some way. Now, of course, that's good. If a pretty girl, she likes you, but already your, your judgment is going to be um, hampered. So, you know, you know how women, they wear scarves in church on S Sunday. I advise them to wear scarves outside of church and, and the makeup has to go like I think, and plus for a woman too, for a woman, it's validating when a giga orthodox Chad likes them. So you have these two people who are in a mild state of lust. And I think Christians have to watch out that, yes, you're doing it correctly and you're doing a courtship, a traditional courtship, no uh, kissing and things like that. But you still have to watch out just because you're not actually physical doesn't mean that those thoughts can't impair you. So that's one thing. Uh, kind of like a warning that I wanted to put out. You have to be very, very careful. This is, I mean, sex is really the easiest way, the number one way that Satan gets us to fall. And um, he wants even, he he doesn't want us to marry because marriage is a sacrament. He doesn't want to make more Christians, but he wants us to fall before that. He wants us to fall and, and then fall into despair that we're never going to do it, that we're too weak and to erode our faith. So I think that as Christians, we have to be very careful that just because we see a secular person uh, maybe sleep with his wife before they marriage, before they marry, and their marriage seems very happy right now, well, we don't know, we just don't know what their spiritual state is. So we just have to keep in mind that we know what we have to do, just follow the God's commandments, and just be very careful not to get too enticed through the through the validation of being liked by the opposite sex yeah um so obviously we we know that that marriage is a sacrament in the orthodox church um what a what mindset really should your partner be in like at what what attitude or, or what is the view of the purpose of marriage? Because I think we can contrast that to what we just described. In my opinion, a woman should look at a man or a man should look at a woman and say to themselves, you are the vehicle, the instrument to me become to God. To me, being able to save my soul, I will save my soul through you, through the family that we create. That's my opinion. That's my approach from what I studied and read um, from the Holy Fathers, from priests that I've talked to, and so on. Really, uh, you should have in your mind that salvation would be harder without this person. If I didn't have her or him, whose feet would I wash in the metaphorical sense, like Christ washed the feet of the apostles? For, you know, so it shouldn't be someone, well, that you look at, I'll be happy with them, and I'll get to engage in physical intimacy. I mean, those are parts of it, but it really should be someone that is critical. I mean, there's monks that I've met, and I've talked to them and asked, why did you become a monk? And for me, to become a monk would be something of a backup plan, like things in the world didn't pan out, you got divorced, or you couldn't find a wife and you're getting older. Yeah, let me go become a monk now, you know, because I don't really have anything else going on. That's what I guess my um, misguided view on it was. But really, it was something else. It was monks were telling me I became a monk because I believed I wouldn't have been saved otherwise, that the world would eat me up. I would fall hard. And they would tell me what they were doing. Uh, before they became a monk that told me, yeah, they, they were in trouble there. So they became a, a monk for their salvation. And uh, I think marriage, you know, is not that different. We should get married because we believe it's, it's, it is a better way to serve God than living alone, serving our own needs, our own dogs, uh, you know, LARPing as a monk in some cabin in the wood, which 
would, which I want to do. But <laughs> uh, so that's what I would say. My idea of it is. I live. I live out here in the mountains now too myself. So uh, I, I, it's been quite an adjustment for me since uh, I'm a native city boy. But uh, here I am in the mountains now. Have you have you thought about? And, and this this kind of bothers me too <laughs> because of uh, my past. Have you thought about how your past promiscuity might affect any? relationship with your future spouse if there is one and how we could how we can overcome that it's hard to say right now because i haven't really gotten into um i guess you would say uh, the end stage of a courtship or a marriage since then but i could tell you that not a day goes back not a day goes by that I'm not haunted by a memory of something I did in the past or a dream, a filthy dream. Uh, it's kind of, I conformed my soul around sexual sin. Uh, my flesh has many attachments. I, I developed an attachment to it that I'm beginning to heal from. It damaged me in a very strong way that I'm reminded of every day where into my mind pops a memory that I forgot about. But yeah, I did that. I did that evil deed. I corrupted a woman in the process. I corrupted myself. So you're never going to heal. Comp your, your body is never in terms of the physical and the mental, the flesh parts of your body is never going to heal from it totally. But spiritually, I think I'm um, far along healing. I think God can heal you sp spiritually in that taking you out of that black pit, knowing that you can be redeemed in spite of the evil acts that you've, that you've done and move on and move on and serve him and grow in your faith every day. I think I'm a good example of that, that no matter how evil you have, I, I, I not only committed the evil, but I led other people. I enabled other people to commit it to thousands of other men. But in the physical sense, you know, maybe I'm sure it's going to affect the expectations that you have with the woman. Um, if you didn't resolve any per perversion, that you that's going to cause a problem in the marriage um, if you develop a kink or something that it's not something that God wants us to perform you know that could also so you have to work those out before you have to work those out before not find out that you still have them during the marriage so it's what you crave what, what do you still f fantasize about you know make sure you settle that first make sure you turn away from the pornography masturbation um, you know, and the lustful th thoughts too. You sh we should not, as Christian men, be fantasizing about being intimate with a woman. We should not be staring at scantily clad women in the summertime. I mean, they're everywhere. I just kind of hide in my mother's <laughs> apartment <laughs> so I don't have to deal with that. But it's really doing the actions now to turn away from that, to uh, reduce the, uh, the uh, attachment, to sever that flesh thirst for all that stuff that you were doing. Um, once you do that, you call upon God's God's help. I think, you know, I think if I meet a wife when I'm ready, I'm not now, I don't think, but I don't think it will hurt too much from how I see it because of the healing that God has allowed me to do. And because I'm doing it myself now with his help, as long as you turn away from sin, if you're in a state of where you're not participating in carnal sin, I think you'll be more then ready to um, serve a wife in a way that God wants. Mm, that's good. Good. I think, uh, I mean, one thing that I, I was kind of looking around for my prayer book, but it's in the other room. Um, I think in the evening prayers, in the Jordanville prayer book, there's towards the end where uh, one of the prayers to the Theotokos, it actually says, uh, help me. Uh, forget my evil uh, mm -hmm. memories of my evil deeds, something along those lines. So I know just um, praying to the Theotokos is, is helpful with that. Um, let's see if we have any questions from no super chats today, but it's okay. It tends to happen when, when everyone's entrenched in the, uh, into the interview. Let's see if we have any Feel free to ask questions, folks. 
And actually, the, there's one comment I wanted to make. I uh, thought about my mother and father and the secular upbringing that they gave me. And one thing I, I counted how many women they introduced me to as a potential partner, as a potential woman that I could marry. Because I think we know a lot of um, uh, mothers and fathers, they want their kids to marry. It seems like my, my parents weren't as interested in that because when I counted the number of women that my parents introduced me to were zero, zero, none. And I said, mom, why, why didn't you try to introduce me to anyone? And she said, well, all these women, they're not that good out there anyway. And plus you seem like a picky person, <laughs> which is fine. But I mean, I think in the past we had a lot of help. I mean, in the previous ge generation, we had a lot of help from our parents, our family. They were probably constantly trying to set us up. But now, I don't know. It's like um, from my my own experience and the experience of other men similar to me in age or maybe a little bit younger, the boomer parents, they just didn't care. I mean, they, they just didn't really find the need or they tried to pair us with a woman who was totally not suitable. Um, so that's kind of sad because to go this alone, alone, I mean, to meet I mean, to meet a woman, a, a spouse, this is a community act. This is something to continue the furtherance of the village, of the family name, on and on, in uh, servitude to God. But now we're on our own. We're in this really dangerous world where most people seem to want to sin. They're clawing at us. They're on the internet be making false gods out of any anything possible except God uh, or not trying to to worship God. So how can we do this on our own without any help and a smartphone? I mean, this is something that this to date, to not know the families of the girls or men we're talking to, this is very hard. And if you're on your own and just, I'm alone and I'll just go to church on Sunday and hope I meet a girl there, I, I hope so too. But it wasn't supposed to be like this. So we're stuck in this weird limbo stage um, before the total collapse of of this of this country, before the secular world realizes how much damage is going on, I don't know. I, I just I just don't I don't have a lot of confidence that every man out there can on his own do this. We, we weren't supposed to do it in this way, and it's causing a lot of pain. Yeah, I agree. Uh, that's an interesting point. Uh, Theodora KP, thank you for the ten dollars, but no, no comment. That's uh, that's what women should do. They should be silent and just send money. Appreciate it. Just kidding. JK, uh, Paisios pointed out the uh, what I was referencing and deliver me from many and cruel memories and deeds and free me from all the evil effects. And so it's actually in the morning prayer. Uh, Byzantios, uh oh, wrong one. Ah, they keep moving up. Uh, Byzantios uh, says, what specific point or gradual process? I think we kind of hit that in the beginning of the interview. <laughs> um, Big time, I prayed for the first time. When I prayed for the first time, then the flood of grace came, and I was able to stop that. Though before that, I gradually started to walk away from it. Uh, my sister's death definitely changed my perspective on the behavior that I was doing. I started to feel totally disgusted with myself for sleeping with these women when I had such a uh, hole in my life due to losing someone close to me. So that was a, a, a factor. But the ability to stop it, the ability to just turn totally away from it, uh, that's, that's when I got. Yeah. Uh, Paisios says, Rush was reflecting back on your experience meeting Elder Ephraim, a factor in you becoming Orthodox. What a great blessing. He was truly one of the great saints of our day. Yeah, I would say that that and many of my other experiences in the monasteries uh, was a factor. Each encounter with a monk such as him, and that was a big encounter. You know, the 
funny thing is I didn't understand it at the time, but when I met him, I achieved a sudden change in my state. And if people don't know the story, I was <clears throat> fighting with, with a monk. I was arguing because I wasn't allowed in the narthex because I was in the Oriental Orthodox Church at the time instead of the Eastern Orthodox. And I was angry. I was arguing. And then a little man comes up. And uh, the monk I was arguing with said, that is Elder Ephraim. You may receive a blessing from him. And I said, okay. And I received a blessing from him. And then when I went back to the monk, he wanted to continue the argument. But I totally forgot what we were arguing about. My anger was completely gone. Now I see it. What was that? Now I can understand what happened time i thought i didn't understand it i didn't know that hey this man's uh grace was imparted onto me and removed this evil pride that i was engaged in i didn't really get it though i felt something but i didn't understand it now i do understand it so but yeah to meet him and uh many of uh, the other orthodox monks too but uh you know some people say that well it's pretty clear that elder ephraim he prayed for you after that and i uh, hope he did and i hope he's happy that i did wind up in the right place where now to where now i can go back to his monastery and i don't have to stay in the narthex of the church i can go inside wow glory to god that's awesome a uh, very serious question from Ray Gregory Santos. He says, how's your relationship with Milo now? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we are we don't hang out face to face. I mean, we're not tight, tight friends. I think Michael knows how it's like to be the internet friend of someone. You're in touch with them once in a while. You share content. But we are fine. Um, you know, after the stream was done, we did talk privately away from the camera and so on and he was not he was not offended by the talk i had and i was not offended by by uh, his tone or whatever and uh, so i think we are fine now and i pray for him and you know i just one thing i can tell you is that going into the talk with him and uh, milo is a roman catholic i did feel that my faith was superior I mean, I can tell you, I can be honest to you. I have the superior faith um, That's and I'm going to enlighten him. And this was, and I've had the superior faith for two months. <laughs> <laughs> so I can tell that my pride was in work. Okay, maybe the intentions were good, but pride is pride. Pride is still a sin. And I went into that interview with a little bit of it, not maybe too much, but I still had it. And I received what I should have received, which was a lashing for other causes. But um, I think anyway, for the people who watched, I think, I hope they got a spiritual benefit out of it. I'm still learning. And as you know, once you stick a camera in front of someone and you're off the cuff, you so sometimes you, things take over. You start saying things that you shouldn't. And after the conversation is done, like, uh, and this is why I like to write. Cause when I write, I'm cool headed. I can review, I can edit. I like to edit, but when you're talking off the cuff, you can't do that. I, I I have no experience with that. I've never said anything on camera that I regret. So, I'm kidding, kidding. Um, Sean Finnegan says with five dollars super chat. Just finished your book, American Pilgrim, and really enjoyed it. God bless you both. Well, God bless you too, Sean. Uh, let's see. Ooh, the reaction. Let's see. They're coming in fast, so I'm trying to. The reaction with the 699 super chat. Roosh, I'm sure your sister would be very proud of you. I'm curious, was she a believer? God bless. Yeah, she was baptized in the Armenian Orthodox. Well, in the you know now I used to say Armenian Orthodox Church to make to make it feel to me that I'm close to the Orthodox Church, but most Armenians don't use that term. They use the term Armenian Apostolic Church. But anyway, well, you know I was away. I really can't even answer you clearly on that. But it wasn't where it needed to be. Uh, so I pray for her daily. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. 
uh, how God is going to treat her. I don't know how God is going to judge her. It's out of my hands, but I do pray for her. I think, you know, I like to tell myself, well, if she was alive today, her big bro would teach her the faith and all those disgusting things that he was doing. But would I have the faith today if she hadn't hadn't died? So I have to trust in God's plan that he has given everyone an opportunity who wants to repent, who wants to be saved, to be saved. I have to trust in that and continue on my path here. But yeah, I do I do wonder, and I hope she's in a good place. And I hope, you know, this is something that a lot of parents have to understand that if you don't teach kids your faith, when the parents die, who's going to pray for for them, who's going to pray for mom and dad once they died? When you raise essentially barbarian kids that don't even know how to pray, um, who's going to pray for me after I die? Hopefully, you know I'll do one last live stream on my deathbed and say, "Please pray for me." And uh, but yeah, that's kind of sad that people are passing. They didn't have the faith. They're in trouble. They're in trouble for judgment, and they don't have anyone to pray for them. No one is going to submit their names on the prayer books in the Orthodox Church you give at the beginning of the liturgy. And it's it's sad. I think a lot of people don't understand. I don't know if they do understand, they don't. But this lack of faith, this purely secular obsession of feeling good in this life, and that's that's not going to end well. Yeah, yeah. I know one... Um... Well, we can we can all pray for your sister. Um, certainly, getting the monasteries to pray as well—that's good. And uh, one thing I always think about is, you know, one big thing in orthodoxy is the remembrance of death. Um, so, one thing that I want to do, I want to order my coffin and use it as like a coffee table, mm. and then get a plot at a monastery. Because if you get your plot at a monastery, they commemorate you um, forever, as long as until till the uh, resurrection of the yeah. dead. So that's that's something I'd like to do. So maybe just the uh, I may have to all. do that too. Yeah, yeah. Like I uh, want an Orthodox cross over my grave. I want. I don't want like a, a obelisk that I see at some <laughs> graves or a Jewish star. I want the Orthodox cross. <laughs> <laughs> for sure um let's see ky says what oh uh well looks like he's uh willing to incinerate your old books for you and why have you stopped lifting i thought people were just saying how jacked i look <laughs> <laughs> they you were, know i think they... lifting for the point of looking good to me is vanity i mean that's just i know most people most men who came out of the red pill they think no lifting is good look do whatever you want you don't need my permission to lift um, but me i only do what is needed to put myself in a mental bodily state to worship god i don't need to be jacked to worship god i need to be fit i need to have a clear mind i need to be able to do the prostrations that i want but i don't need to be jacked so please don't project your desire for being jacked onto me <laughs> you hear that luke kendrat do you hear that <laughs> He doesn't even lift. That's natural for him. <laughs> he was born that way. That's just part of being half Russian, half Greek. So, uh, Test Run asks Should Christians stay in the cities or leave the country, leave for the countryside? This is an individual de decision. If you're a single man, why flee? I mean, what, what, what do you need to flee for? from i mean uh, what what do you anticipate you'll be doing in the future that you can't serve your cross you can't carry your cross here and now but then again uh depends on what you mean by flee does flee say move to a red state one state over does flee mean move to another uh, another country i know that michael has advocated for moving to a red state now that's fine advice i don't have any problem my concern is I'm seeing a history of red states turning blue. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that may just be buying you time, but it's not bad advice. Now, if you have a, a, a family and your family of four and the local Walgreens is always closed because it's being shoplifted, 
and um, the schools and there's gays everywhere, then yeah, maybe moving is a good idea because your three-year-old can't carry your cross in the same way that you can. But if you're a single man, I mean, if you know, I, I live in a predominantly black area <laughs> and I'm just learning. I mean, if I can live here and make it work, I can live anywhere. So, but it really depends on you, what you want to accomplish and where your faith is. There's no clear answer. I'm always going to gonna shill for West Virginia. I just love it here. My <laughs> family roots since the 18th century. So I had to come settle here. Just had to. Um, but yeah, I understand. It's also not, you know, as much as I advocate for it, not everybody can do it. You can't just leave your family to like, if you, like, I know someone who really wants to, but their family's like in New Jersey and they can't leave their parents, elderly parents, you know, hundreds of miles away. It's just, you know, you have to be in a position to do it and it just has to work. Um, just, uh, you know, just pray. <laughs> uh pa pano says fine step one find waifu step two flee with waifu so i get i get um ray says i look like a telemarketer is well you know i guess i'm uh i guess so anyway let me let me see i think we might have some i don't know i think i got through all the super chats anyways um, any final points that, that you'd like to make, Roosh? I appreciate you coming on the show today. Yeah, I just feel feel good about being in God's church. I mean, I can't uh, ex explain how, what, and I feel bad for all the two or three Armenians that are watching now. Um, I don't want to, coming to the Orthodox Church was um I can say the best thing that I have ever done. Uh, it was, I can feel it. I can feel that it's making a difference. It's, it's, there's already, there's going to be fruits from my conversion and many others who come to this church. And uh, without this church, life would be just a series of trials and difficulties that I wouldn't be able to understand and would feel so alone in dealing with, with these problems, I would feel lost. I would feel like the world is attacking me. And while the world is attacking me, I know who is behind me and it's Christ. And he has my back, so to speak. And I am not anxious, but apprehensive. I'm apprehensive what how the world is going to turn out. It's going to be ugly. I don't think I see, we all know things aren't getting better and uh, things are going to get worse and worse, but we're in the in the church, we're in communion with God. For that reason alone, I feel great. I read the lives of the saints and the brutal tortures they've had they had to face, how Christ stood by them. If he stood by them, he's going to stand by us too. Um, you know, just just try not to get pulled away from the church through all these secular entertainments and trends and lusts and the passions they try to put into you. Even you have to be careful with the apps, the TikTok and the Instagram. Just be a, a little bit careful because anything that's not explicitly Christian is going to try to pull you down. If it's not talking about God, it's secular. If it's secular, the point is to pull you away. Uh, so we have to really be careful, try to find a podvig uh, aesthetic labor that we do for the sake of Christ that, you know, strengthens our spiritual strength that uh, gets that grace going. But we have to just be very, very careful. And this even includes listening to music with secular lyrics, movies. I mean, Satan has developed a system. It's like we're in this panopticon of uh, secular options that are all around us. And we have to be very, very careful. We have to think about what we're doing and the type of life that we are living. If this is not bringing us closer to God, why are we doing it? And just keep going one day at a time. I can't think of a better note to end on. So if I didn't get to your questions, I apologize. Uh, Roosh, where can people follow you? Why don't you tell us about your forum that I keep promising Michael Whitkoff I will join. <laughs> I will, I promise, once I get a moment. <laughs> 
So people can read my articles and watch my videos at my blog, roosh.v.com. That's R-O-O-S-H-V.com. And I have a forum. It used to be a forum on teaching men how to pick up girls. We would share the best tips. And I totally de- deleted all of that. I reformed it around a mostly Christian oriented, more of an imp- implicit Christian forum. We still talk about the news and culture and things like that, but you cannot curse. That's one of the rules. No cursing. No Christian should be sub- subjected to foul language on my sites. So th- for that, they can go to rushvforum.com. Awesome. Well, I thank you for coming on, Roosh, and everyone watching. Thank you. If you're new to the channel, please give me a like and subscribe. And I will see you guys next week.